Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Convergence Enigma here with Josh and Stefan. I am your host, Stefan Gearhart, joined as always by the man with some new spectacles, my good friend Josh Rutledge. How are you today, sir? I'm doing fantastic. You know what's amazing is that these glasses were $65, and I love them more than the expensive pair that my insurance you know, bought for me. So, um... Oh, I thought you were about to give us a sponsored moment that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, for those of you guys paying attention, uh, we've got our good friend Mark D'Antonio back on the horn with us. Hey, Mark, how's it going, man? Good, man. How are you? Doing really good. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. We had an absolute blast the last time, and uh, Josh and I were very impressed with your talk at the MUFON Symposium. And oh, thank you. Had to get you back. Had to get you back. Yeah, I was like, I've, we've got to share this with the world. I don't know if anybody else is 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 getting has gotten any of this information but man uh it blew me away when i heard it at the mm -hmm. MUFON symposium and so i knew right then and there that i had to get you back on to talk about it so well it's this is very cool and you know it it's building on work that uh, was done by several other people uh, as well you know none of us work in a vacuum and and to say right. we do is crazy right so um it's it's you know we all get where we are by standing on the shoulders of giants so right. I, I've done the same thing in my life. You guys have done the same in yours. So, uh, but we'll relay as much. I'll relay as much as I uh, I can that I know, and uh, I just think it's fascinating because uh, it really opens up the universe. <laughs> yeah, it really does. <laughs> so um, I'm going to share some slides in here for a little bit, and uh, you're gonna we're gonna talk through some of these things and uh, see what we get into. Sure. Okay. So obviously, uh, you know, and you guys just ask questions whenever you want i don't have any problem oh, yeah. with that yeah. i'm interruptible you know totally um and it's not my intent to like do a lecture nobody wants to hear lectures but it's sort of a, a cool conversation to have oh yeah and like i call this yes they are here for a reason and and i'm an astronomer that's what i do for a living um you know and uh astronomers aren't supposed to talk about alien life uh being here we talk about alien life as as if you know well you know it'll be microbial or it'll be uh like you know little tiny bugs under the, the south polar cap of mars maybe uh, but we don't talk about life forms as being intelligent life forms that have plied the gulf between the stars and shown up here you're not supposed to do that you know because we don't and it's true we don't have the evidence of it but we have the ability to foresee possibilities and there's no reason we can't speculate. I step out of the box. I speculate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all speculation. But it's logical speculation based on science. And that's the thing that I think is so interesting about this. And so one of the things that I want to mention is that, you know, when we, when we talk about the vast universe, you know, uh, with our, we have a remote observatory we run called the SkyTour Livestream. Skytour live stream is on YouTube. Uh, we stream the night sky for people, and we show them that's all these fascinating locations in the sky. I don't know. That's, if that, that's out in Arizona, isn't it? It is. It's actually out in the Arizona desert, in the middle of the desert. It's um, remote uh, operations. I actually run it from here in Connecticut. Um, and I had, uh, gosh, uh, a whole bunch of people the other night from all over the world watching, and we looked at some beautiful deep sky objects yeah. you know uh, we actually image this guy um this is this is not our image this is the hubble image but these are the pillars of creation you might remember okay yeah and, and these are in two different types of uh light okay um this one is in infrared and this one is the hubble uh visual palette and all these little things you see in here these dark areas to me these are the hot button in the, in the world of astronomy, for instance, and life forms elsewhere, because it's in those dark areas, those cold areas where uh, planets and stars are made. Now, we know that planets and stars are made in these, these stellar nurseries, these emission nebulae, for instance. And, you know, we've imaged many of them. OK, these are yeah. galaxies and and these are the this is the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared system. But this right here. For instance, this this guy right here, that's that right there is a stellar nursery. This is a stellar nursery. This is a stellar nursery. These are places where stars are born. But it's not just stars. Because yeah. in there we're getting planets too. And you know, if you look at the totality of the stars in a galaxy, okay, well, 
in our galaxy, we could have several tens of millions at the low end, low end, Earth-like planets in our galaxy. And at the high end, we could have several billion Earth-like planets. That means planets that are not too hot, not too cold, the Goldilocks zone, as we say, right. <laughs> and planets that can have liquid water on their surface. And be something that carbon-based life forms, which is what we are, can survive in. No, you know, and all that remains is to detect whether there's oxygen in an atmosphere of one of these types of planets. And if there is, well, then it's possible that life, advanced life, could arise there potentially. And uh, you know, and I say potentially because we can't say for sure any of these things yet, right? But as I said, I like to speculate. Yeah. Now, Mark, okay. one of the things I always wondered about, um, you know, we obviously established our Goldilocks zone idea based on our proximity to our sun, but our sun is different, right? There's all, all different types of stars. And I'd imagine that the Goldilocks zone is different depending on the type of star that it is. Uh, that's that's absolutely true. Okay. And if you look here, this, this, this image shows that pretty well. Okay. Uh, this guy here, all these planets here, these are some of these are called super Earths. They're bigger than the Earth, okay? But they're also, okay, because here's the Earth right here. You see that little, it says Earth, and you have that little round ball. That's the size of the Earth. Our these little, are super buddy. Yeah, that's it, man. That's a tiny Earth. The, the, the little blue marble, right, that we always say. Right, right. Okay, but these are planets that have been discovered uh, by the Kepler Space Telescope. These are potentially habitable planets. Now, this isn't all of them. See, Hubble found, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the Kepler Space Telescope found over 5,000 possible worlds. <laughs> okay. And 4,000 have been confirmed. So, you know, over 4,000. So, we're looking at a number of them. And then the uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is known as TESS, that's this right here. TESS actually found a whole bunch of them as well. Uh, and it looked at a very, very large swath of sky. You know, the, the Kepler Space Telescope, was like a laser it focused on one star at a time but look at the size of the field that that tess looked at okay this this telescope looked at a 24 degree by 96 degree field that's a gigantic field of view yeah. and it looked at all those stars all at once to try and see planets passing in front of their star and if they pass in front of their star from our point of view they take away a tiny bit of that star's light and that's what we can detect. We can detect that tiny bit of starlight that's been taken away. And thus, based on the speed at which it goes, the, the, the depth of the curve, we can get its mass, we can get its size, we can get its, uh, its orbital velocity and its distance from the star. And that gives us an idea whether it's habitable if we know what kind of star it is. See, so all these things get put in place and all these things make a huge difference uh for us you know it, it'll come a time where we're gonna uh, you know be able to see uh planets uh, around another star in fact we're getting very close to that now we actually uh would we we can see some of the bigger ones now we can't see any of the earth-like planets around other stars but we can see the bigger ones like the jupiter size and above mm -hmm. uh, we can actually visually see them uh, and it takes Fantastic. they take years to go around their their star because they're so far out you know, from what we see so far, but pretty cool. Mm, amazing. Yeah. Now, the whole point is, um, how are we going to find these planets? And never mind that, how is an advanced race that's on one of these planets, if such a race exists, and I think they very well could have, mm -hmm. how are they going to get here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, how are they going to get here? And never mind that, why are they going to come here? Right. <laughs> okay. It's vacation. First of all, You've seen pictures of the Milky Way, right, guys? You, you've seen that, like uh, hundreds of thousands of stars. It's like all these stars. Why would they single out ours? What would make our star, and more notably our planet, something that they would be attracted to? What do you think? Now, this is a test question. I say the platypus, to be honest. The with platypus. You. <laughs> <laughs> the platypus. Oh, the platypus is, I think, an accident of evolution. I mean. <laughs> uh, a ductile creature that has a poison spine on one's rear, right rear legs. I don't, mm -hmm. 
I just don't get that. What did nature do? What was it doing? Uh, nature had to be smoking something that day. Well, it was, it was obviously an ET that came to visit in, <laughs> in, in state. So. A, hey, Torg, watch this. We're going to combine this duck with a thing. And, <laughs> whatever. And look, right, whatever look what I made. <laughs> right. I don't know. That doesn't look good to me. I don't know. But I throw it in the water. It won't reproduce. <laughs> in this, you know. Platypi. <laughs> yep. It'll sink or swim. We don't know. That's right. It, it swam. <laughs> you know. So the, the question is, what would what makes us something that's so attractive? Well, first of all, if an alien race is out there, what do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna look for a planet that is suitable for their life because they, they that's what they're gonna start with. And the way I know that is because that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're looking for planets that have an oxygenated atmosphere, aren't we? Yep. Okay, now we're doing that because we're carbon-based beings. Now, you might say, well, you know, life forms don't have to be carbon-based. Actually, I beg to differ. You may not be saying that, but, but people do say that. Uh, but I beg to differ. You know, carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe. That's one, two, three, four. Hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and carbon. Okay, well, that carbon goes into making um, what we are. And that third most abundant, the oxygen, all right, that's what we use to make our energy and to keep our life forms going. So if you're a carbon based being out there, you're probably going to be using oxygen, and respiration will probably be part of your. Uh, existence and, and how you manage your biological processes. So you're going to breathe in some fashion oxygen and utilize it in order to carry on. So if you're an advanced species, you're going to go and look for oxygen in another planet's atmosphere. And that's what we see right here. Oxygen is number eight in the table, but that by no means means it's abundance in the universe. That just happens to be its atomic weight. Okay, how many protons it has in its nucleus. Okay, now this oxygen, okay, is very important. Now, if we can detect oxygen in an atmosphere of a planet, it means that the planet will stand out like a sore thumb as a potential location where we can survive if it's in that habitable zone, that Goldilocks zone we talk about. Mm -hmm. And if it has liquid water on the surface, which it probably will if it's in the Goldilocks zone, that's mm -hmm. the whole point. So we would see it. It would stick out like a sore thumb. And if you look at the, the uh, caption there, it said, you know, the oxygen on our planet started really building up two and a half billion years ago in our atmosphere. Two and a half billion. And what that means is that we have been sending that oxygen signal out two and a half billion light years. Right. And that means in all directions that people could, you know, wit witnesses could see uh, aliens or people, beings, whatever. And that means that, that the oxygen in our atmosphere has been visible for that long, which means that we stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. You know, Stephen Hawking famously said, well, you know, if we're, <clears throat> if we're out there, we should probably keep a low profile. Let's not announce our presence. As smart as he was, uh, I don't know that he was accounting for the oxygen buildup because it happened very quickly in our atmosphere. In fact, it was called the great oxidation event in our atmosphere. And it happened so fast that uh, the only potential explanation for it would have been life forms generating all this oxygen because that's what it is. The phytoplankton, the plankton that, you know, use light for their survival in the ocean. Okay. They, uh, will gobble up some carbon dioxide and generate oxygen. Right. So their waste product is oxygen. So you're breathing the oxygen, which is a waste product of uh, um, creatures in our ocean. That's kind of odd, right? You're, right you're, yeah. you're breathing bacteria, poop, whatever. I, I, I mean, you know, when you think about the fact that all the <laughs> all the fresh water we have is all we've ever had and all we ever will have, and whenever you take that drink of water, you're also drinking after somebody else who has previously drank it, right? So. You can always go down that path. A little bit, a little, <laughs> a little water action for you. I'm, a little unnerving to think about. I mean, you know, you, you, Einstein's pee right now. So. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Okay, you could be drinking some of the water that, that Einstein drank. And he dribbled down on his 
on his shoes and said, ah, Eureka, I just figured something out. Right. You know? <laughs> um, but the thing is, so the, so the oxygen is really important. And uh, that that led to this this event where we stand out like a sore thumb. And so if you're an alien race looking in you know the universe for well, another habitable planet like your own, just like we're doing, and let's say you were doing this, say, 5,000 years ago, because maybe you're, you know, 10,000 years or a thousand years more advanced than, than us. But, you know, back then, um, you, you say you're looking 5,000 years ago and you see this oxygen signal coming from this planet. You might, if you have the technology, mount an expedition to go visit it. Mm -hmm. Just like we're talking about doing. Yeah, really. Right. So it's like, you know, just because we're talking about it doesn't mean it, it, it's it, it's we're the only ones doing it. Right. I think there's a, a, a necessity here of of thought when you think about visiting another planet. We're not the only ones. It's necessary to remember that it's a universe full of potential other beings. We're not the first ones on the block. We're actually relatively recent. Yeah, really. I mean, in the, in the grand span of our existence, right, a couple hundred thousand years like yeah, say, I mean, and only five thousand years since we started actually writing down our history, like with the right. you know, Sumerian cuneiform tablet language that pecking in in stone. Okay, that well, the cuneiform uh, language uh, it was something that only started recording our history in earnest about five thousand years ago. So we're a very young species. You know, we're the new kids on the block. Um, we're kind of new to this whole cosmic game. And the galaxy, well, the galaxy is everywhere you turn. The galaxy is trying to kill us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so many species may have been wiped out. Uh, others may have persisted and been able to carry on. But to do it, they have to advance in their technology. Mm -hmm. Right. They might see the oxygen here. Okay. They might see that oxygen in that atmosphere, but they can't get to that planet. Not without some kind of technology to go between the vast distances. Um. So, in 1994, Miguel Alcubierre came up with a, uh, a, a thought problem. Uh, it was a mathematical tensor that described a way to warp space uh, and fold space and make what's far away near and what's near far away. So, basically, it's like taking two opposite corners of a piece of paper, folding them up near each other, jumping across a tiny gap, and then unfolding it. Yeah. Now, that warp would be created by... Uh, something called a warp bubble and it required a lot of energy in his mathematics to create it and that uh, energy at that time was the equivalent of converting the entire planet jupiter to energy <laughs> so obviously it was colossally impossible to even uh, right. do or even imagine it could be done so it was put on a shelf hey miguel cool thing but <laughs> let's move on okay but then now, Sonny White at Eagle Works Laboratories, which is a NASA-funded laboratory, he began uh, checking out the Alcubierre process, and he figured out that, hey, we don't need as much energy to do this as Miguel did. I, I think we can do this with the energy uh, created by, say, converting the Voyager spacecraft to energy, not the planet Jupiter. So we're, we're already got a 10 to the 26 power Reduction in the amount of mass we need to make this warp bubble. Whoa, hey, that brought it down into a distant, very, very, very distant, but yet kind of sort of plausible reality as a possibility. And then they thought, well, you know, every time this warp occurred, uh, the the ship that you're traveling in this, this rarefied bubble, okay, uh, is going to have on the, on the uh, for lack of a better term, on its windscreen or the, the energy facing the direction that you're going, uh, is going to accumulate a lot of energetic particles. And when you stop, like bugs in a windshield, uh, you're going to have all these bugs in your windshield, but they're going to come blasting off at a high rate of speed and very destructive. So they had to have a way of uh, figuring out a way to bleed those energy levels off um, in this particular um, you know, methodology of travel. So enter another guy named Froning and, and, uh, Froning and, uh, Sonny and the Alcubierre concept got together and they came up with the Froning Alcubierre drive. What is that? Well, that's the same thing, except now as they travel, they're actually 
not allowing the particles to get on the ship. They're actually going around it. Kind of like shields in Star Trek. Hmm. Yeah. In very, by, by any other name. But you see science fiction kind of becoming science fact. We right, see it all right. the time. Right? Yeah. It's like so, uh, when, they, when they do those uh, wind tunnel tests for aerodynamics of uh, cars. Right? Yeah, that's you, what I was thinking too. You see like the smoke kind of flowing over the car and around the car to kind of show you it's aerodynamics. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, and but in space, we don't have the benefit of compressed air that's being compressed and making this this uh, laminar flow around the surface and not quite connecting with the surface. In space, where there's nothing there, certainly a tiny little particle is going to strike the ship. Right. And uh, we, we could easily damage the ship with, with that kind of thing. So they had to create some type of additional way to keep the particles off the ship and like basically reproduce that process you're just describing. Yeah, and that's sure. sort of what they did. And that's what that uh, froning variation of the Alcubierre drive will do. So now that it only needed the energy of say like the Voyager spacecraft to make this warp bubble, which could then warp and bring the corners of the paper together and release them. Okay. Now that they had that, it looked like a distantly plausible possibility. So uh, it's something that Eagle Works Laboratories for a period of time uh, was and may still be working on uh, as a possibility. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, with our current technology, it would take us about 10,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri at the fastest speed we've ever traveled as human beings. Huh, okay. And that's just conventional, like uh, the New Horizons probe going to Pluto got exceedingly fast. It would still take it 10,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri. So obviously that's not going to work. The Alcubierre drive, on the other hand, could get us to Alpha Centauri in as little as a week. Okay. She said, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a huge improvement. Right. Yeah. But it's still too slow. It's still too slow. It's like, oh, man, what are you going to do? Well, now what we have to do is something else. And that something else is we have to start looking at the possibilities that lie within the four fundamental forces in the universe and see what we can use that in the quantum world that might help us in this macro world. And this is, this is where I think uh, UFOs, if you will, UAP, if you must. Okay. <laughs> Please don't. Just call them UFOs. <laughs> this is where this is where they probably exist. Okay, they exist using technologies that are uh, basically gleaned from these four fundamental forces. And let me just, I'm going to describe these forces really fast for you because uh, the one we want to focus on is gravitation. Okay, but the weak force, this the weak force here. This is the the force that is. Uh, it, it's at the quantum level, right? Obviously, we're talking about something that are, you know, inside um, uh, an, an atom. And this helps, say, a neutron, of which sometimes a neutron can get captured into an atomic nucleus. It helps a neutron get changed into a proton, okay? Now, what does that mean? It means that this force is, the well, the reason you're here. <laughs> because without this force... Uh, a helium atom might not be changed into a carbon atom or uh, a magnesium might not be changed eventually into, say, an iron atom, okay, by having protons added to it. Um, it allows additional elements in the periodic table to be built. Okay, that's the weak force. Now, the strong force binds it all together, you know, and inside of the atom, uh, you know, you have protons, neutrons, right, and Electrons are outside and so on. Okay. Well, the the strong force is what binds the neutrons and the uh, protons together inside of an atom because they hold together the, the components that actually make the protons. And these are called quarks. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the smallest type of particle we know about is the quark. And there's three quarks per proton, but who cares? The bottom line is that it's such a powerful force it only works to a certain distance and then it really doesn't work anymore, which is why there's an upper limit to the number of atoms that you can, the number of protons you can have in an element. So 118 seems to be about the level uh, that's the max. We can't seem to go higher than that because then the strong force can't hold the whole nucleus together anymore. Okay. So uh, is, is that kind of a science joke, you think, that 
the uh, Ferengi on Deep Space Nine who, who was short and ran a bar. His name was Cork. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that um, I don't think that they really knew too much science. Uh, the writers were just having a ball. <laughs> hey, I, I, I've heard of a Cork. Yeah, me too. That's a cool name. Yeah. Let's, let's give him the name. Okay, Cork's Bar. Yeah, that's cool. You know, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But um, so those two forces are are important, but uh, they don't really have a whole lot to do with getting from one place to another in the universe. Um, they have a lot to do with the materials made in the universe, so that you can you know make life forms and so forth. Um, but the next force, uh, uh, next one is the electromagnetic uh, force, which is light. And notice it's electromagnetic, which is like electricity and magnetism. Well, light is just that. Light is an electric field and a magnetic field that's perpendicular to it like this, propagating. And uh, weird as that sounds, that's what light is. Um, and then... Um, the 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 thing that carries that force is the photon, all right? Uh, for the for the weak force, okay, they're called you know it's a W a boson it's called, but that that's what allows uh, a neutron to be converted into a proton, okay? Now um, one of the things uh, uh, that is interesting is that when you get to gravity now, okay, these other three objects we're talking about here, these other three, these all can be described with a wave and seen as a particle, right? That we talk about the weak force uses a particle called a W boson. The strong force uses a, uh, a gluon particle, okay? The electromagnetism is a, has a photon, a particle. And we know that light can be a light wave as well, okay? We can, see, we, we can describe light as a wave and a particle. We can describe the st strong and weak force in terms of equations of waves as well. Gravity is the weird one. Gravity we can't see as more than uh, just a wave right now. And, and Einstein predicted we wouldn't even find that. He thought we'd never see gravity waves, but we did with merging neutron stars. Suddenly, and you know, boom, we saw these gravity waves. Wow. But we've never found a graviton, the equivalent of the photon, but for gravity, right? Yeah. The carrier of gravitational force. The, the graviton. That's something we haven't found yet. Now, if we don't find it, then that's bad for us. We want to find the graviton because the graviton is the thing that I believe alien races are using in order to get to here. Um, so we talk about that. All right. We talk about creating particle accelerators we know about the one at cern right right, right. large hadron collider it's a big round rig this is not it this is just another one <laughs> okay. um but these big round rings they accelerate particles in a circle right and they they do this because uh they constrain the particles to move in a curve with these magnetic fields that they're holding them in place with but around the ring moving out in, in a perpendicular direction to the direction of travel, okay, in every direction you're getting synchrotron radiation, which is uh, a deadly radiation generated by trying to hold particles that want to go straight in a curve, okay? Trying to hold them in a curve when they want to go straight generates this deadly radiation. But what if UFOs, the circular UFOs or triangular UFOs, are actually particle accelerators hmm. generating particles that will help them uh, travel through the universe. Now, how in the world can that happen? Well, the way it can happen is if we think about the universe as being uh, built upon something called string theory. Now, uh, what is string theory? Well, string theory, i, I give you a quick example. We talked about particles uh, just a moment ago, right? Well, let's say for a hydrogen atom, you look at a hydrogen proton, a single proton, it's always moving. It's always vibrating, right? It's always doing this, okay? So if you stopped it here at one end of its travel and then stopped it here at the other end of its travel, what's in between? What's in between is that, that little energetic path that it traveled. That's the string. Think of that as the string. So what if the universe really is composed of those little tiny strings 
And we just think we're seeing particles because that's how our equations work or that's what works for us. Okay. If we can show the strings really exist, then we have some other possibilities uh, uh, on our hands. Okay. We can generate certain particles with our UFOs. Okay. That live in a region that's outside of our X, Y, and Z moving through time. Now, I know I'm kind of jumping a little bit into this. So let me see. If uh, let me see if I can uh, take us back just a little bit, okay. So from here, okay, we look at the fact that these particles that a UFO might generate uh, live in a certain location, all right. That's called the bulk. And I say, what is that? Okay. Well, the bulk has to do with a specific type of string theory. That's called Randall syndrome one. Now, the way that is defined, okay, is that you have, and I know the slides aren't really matching too well. Uh, what, what, what happens is you have our X, Y, and Z all moving through time. Okay. That's four dimensions. Mm -hmm. You have a fifth dimension just outside known as the bulk that we're talking about right here. Okay. And then next to the bulk, you have another plane known as the Planck membrane. Now, our X, Y, and Z moving through time is, is, is our home membrane, okay? They change the terminology on you, okay? It's X, Y, Z moving through time. So it's our home membrane, okay? Then you have the bulk, and then you have the Planck membrane. Now, the thing about the bulk is it's highly warped. So as soon as you leave our X, Y, and Z moving through time, you're now in the bulk, and the bulk is so highly warped that the farther in you go, the closer all distances become. It's so warped that everything is warped from that yeah. perspective. And the farther in, when that happens too, time is slowed down for you as well. So the closer you get to the Planck membrane, that's what happens. So if you can generate particles and you do that with your UFO. You you create them in this ring uh, that, that you have inside your 30-foot UFO. It generates these special particles. These special particles are known as Kaluza Klein particles. And incidentally, CERN is building a whole new um, particle accelerator right now to investigate, in part, Kaluza Klein particles. Yeah. Okay? They're doing this now. They're looking for it. Now, the thing won't be ready until, I think, 2025 or whatever. But they're building this this second accelerator to study these particles. They're 10 to the 16 times stronger uh, than our X, Y, and Z particles that we see here. Now, we're calling them gravitons because that's what we think they might be. And if they're gravitons, it means they're 10 to the 16 times more powerful than our gravitons, which is why when our ship generates them in its particle accelerator, they live out in that bulk space. So if you generate them and you surround your ship with them, guess what happens? Your ship gets dragged into the bulk. All right. Yeah. And as your ship gets dragged into the bulk, your perspective will be that the universe is getting a lot smaller. And the more particles you generate, the farther in you go. And the farther in you go, the more distorted and, uh, and, and uh, the small the universe becomes to you. And distances are shortened all the more. So basically, what you'll do is you will create those particles. And all you need to do it, by the way, is a nuclear fusion reactor. You don't need a black hole harnessed and put in this big thing. No. <laughs> a fusion reactor can generate these KK gravitons, these Kaluza Klein particles. That's all you need. And now once you get those particles, what they do is they're going to sheet your ship. You know, are they gonna? And well, they basically uh, the image I I have is this one. I borrowed it from uh, my friend uh, Bob Schroeder. Okay, okay. This illustrates right here what's going on. Okay, when the UFO generates using its particle accelerator these KK gravitons, because they're ten to the sixteenth times more powerful than our gravitons, they also create micro black holes. Okay, micro black holes are known to exist. But they evaporate very quickly on the order of nanoseconds. So you say, well, what good are they? 
The fact is that we're continuously producing these particles. So you have a continuous level of micro black holes surrounding your ship. The diagram really needs to have them all the way around the ship because that's really how it should be. Okay. So what is that doing? Well, first of all, it's encapsulating your ship in these, these gravitons and micro black holes and the ship is moving into the bulk. Okay. Now what happens when you generate all these micro black holes around your ship? It absorbs well, the light. It absorbs light. Uh, it absorbs some of the molecules of the air briefly, ever so briefly. It also absorbs the gravitons coming from the earth and they never reach your ship. Hmm. Your ship is now completely without effect by gravity on our planet. Hmm. This explains the fluttering leaf effect that you see in here reported with UFOs. They seem to flutter like leaves. That's because they, they're not feeling Earth gravity, so they're just freely moving. Wow. That's the, right? That's the idea. And because, as you said, very rightly and very profoundly, by the way, they absorb some light. But you know what that means? It means when you go to look at them, what are you going to see? It's going to shimmer. It's going to maybe change colors. It's going to disappear right in front of you and maybe come back. And all the reported phenomena that we've heard about with UFOs can occur with this process. <clears throat> so this is pretty exciting. You know, this, this right here uh, could be, and I'm, I'm convinced that, that, you know, this is true. Uh, you know, Bob Schroeder first told me about it, and, and I spent time. He wrote a book called "Solving the UFO Enigma," and he talks a lot about string theory and Maxwell's equations. But you know, <clears throat> you don't have to go into that to, to have people understand it. Um, and he's a good friend, good guy. And I, I signed on to him a long time ago and said, "Yeah, you're right about this, Bob. I'm, I'm quite sure that this is what's going on." You I know, was. Uh Sorry, Mike. I was going to ask. I was yeah. thinking about um, the explanation around uh, the bulk, and I was wondering if I might uh, propose a, an analogy. I don't know if it it helped me maybe to process a little bit. But, um, you know how on the surface of water, there's like that really thin uh, barrier that water bugs and other things can kind of walk around on, and they don't sink down in the water. Surface um, tension. Right, surface tension. So that's you know almost like that uh, that bulk barrier you were speaking of. And then when you're in water, things look a lot closer than what they actually are when you're down in water and you're looking around. And again, kind of that bulk type uh, experience there a little bit. So water almost kind of mimics that explanation. I see where you're going with that, and that's actually a very uh, a very nice analogy. Uh, quite nice, actually. That's a good way to think about it uh i think and uh the, the thing that's interesting is the concept of the bulk and, and this is where it gets hairy um <laughs> and and i'm not expecting anyone to to just swallow this hook line and sinker here uh it's just an offered theory but it does make logical sense the idea is that uh, this is the bulk and everything is all around us we're we're right it's, it's always here uh, and we can be in and out of it uh, all the time. And, and the idea that what the ships do is they generate a certain level of these micro black holes and KK gravitons, okay? And they oscillate uh, in and out of the bulk, <clears throat> right, as they're doing this. And that oscillation uh, will provide uh, uh, the ability for them to stabilize between the two worlds, so to speak. Uh, it also gives them a way for instance, uh, to do what I've personally witnessed on a U.S. submarine to travel underwater at extremely high speeds because they're not actually subject to the water because the yeah. water is really not there for them. Friction. See? Um, and, you know, it was decades ago, which I've told you about, I, I think, on the last time we were together, maybe we talked about it. Um, yeah. There was a, a fast mover seen on the sonar on this, on this particular boat. And uh, the executive officer just said, okay, log it and dog it. And the kid said, sir, yes, sir. And I said, uh, XO, I know what these fast movers might be. Is there anything I can help you with? And he said, you having a good trip so far? I go, yes. He goes, let's keep it that way. <sighs> okay. I'll just sit here. You know, so much for thinking I was a big shot, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then a few years later, I had to do a job for the joint chiefs of staff for the president. Okay. Of the United States. And I brought the project down and I asked 
this particular chief, I said, what can you tell me about the fast mover program? I shouldn't have asked. I mean, that, that's like, <laughs> not a good thing to ask. And uh, <clears throat> he could have said, what's that? Or get out of here or take him into change or whatever. But he didn't. He just said, oh, I can't talk about the program, Mark. I'm sorry. <gasps> I think I want my pants at that point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure I did. <clears throat> so, yeah. But, but see, that was decades ago, guys. Right. Decades ago. And now with the Nimitz incident and all this stuff coming out, I mean, I knew it was just a matter of time. And I didn't start talking about this until the Russians started talking about theirs. You know, they started talking about the fact that a lot of the Russian submarines were seeing these fast movers underwater. And I said in passing to someone at a conference, yeah, our U.S. boats have seen these too. You know, because I do a lot of work for the Navy. I've got a lot of submarine projects that I do for them. I'm doing several right now. And um, they uh, they wouldn't admit to it. You know, the Navy wouldn't admit to it. But the, when the Russians came out and started talking about it, uh, other people in our U.S. Navy were talking about it to me. And then once the Nimitz incident occurred, then everything started coming out. The, the floodgates were just broken open and... It just poured out. I talked to other submariners, and they said I was never in the navy. I was I was a guest on the boat. Okay, right. and uh, other submariners said, "Yeah, we called those jellyfish on our boat." Jellyfish. <laughs> you know why? Because sonar guys can't have an empty box. They have to be able to put everything right. they listen to here in a box. It was this. You know, they can't say they have an unknown. Now, the reason I knew what this kid saw in the sonar was an unknown was because he said so. And when the XO, because he, he didn't know what to classify it as. Right. And, and the XO asked him, how fast is that going? And the kid was facing away from me. And it's noisy on a submarine. You know, it doesn't sound like where you are and where I am. It's noisy here. High pressure air, people talking, you know, but it, the sound never gets out of the boat. That's the pride of the Navy. Right. Well, I could hear how fast it was moving because he literally yelled it in like excitement. He had his hands out like this. And he goes, several hundred knots, sir. And I was like, several hundred knots. Mm. And the XO didn't bat an eyelash. He just looked at him and said, okay, log it and dog it. So yes, sir. And the kid went back to work. It was, it was dropped. It was gone. Like, oh, no. And that's when he told me, you know, let's keep it that way about, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, wonder, I mean, I wonder why, I mean, it, it, you know, let, let's, let's assume uh, for a moment that everything you've kind of laid out here today or tonight is, is accurate, um, <laughs> which I really hope it is. Uh, Cause um, it would explain a lot of things, especially for what Stefan and I have seen and experienced mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. But um, why, why change mediums? If, 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 if you can move through the atmosphere and water the same, right? It, it's like it's nothing to you. Yeah. Why change mediums, I wonder? I got a great reason for that. And it's the only one that makes sense. Okay. And it goes to, it goes to a question like this question here. Where are the aliens hiding? Okay. Are they on the far side of the moon? No, because we're on the far side of the moon. Right. I mean, we have a probe. We have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's mapping every single square meter of this moon okay and so hiding on the moon was a romantic thought at one point but it's not there they're not hiding on the moon okay uh so if you want to google the lro quick map you can actually see uh, what we can understand about the moon so far and it's getting better and better every day as the new imagery comes in so LRO quick map allows you to just zoom and zoom and zoom endlessly into the moon until you're down to a half a meter per pixel. It's fantastic. <laughs> it is fantastic. I've taught people how to use it for several years now. And uh, now, you know, could they be hiding in a deep, perpetually dark crater? Well, maybe. At the South Pole, there's a couple of them. Cabeus Crater, in fact, is one of them, which uh, I hope that's not where they were hiding because we, we dropped a, a rocket stage in there uh, to look, kind of look for water. That was the L-Cross mission. So we might have blown their ship to pieces if we did that let's hope we didn't do that was that before or after the nimitz experience because maybe they were retaliating i'm just saying well that was after that was after okay. the nimitz. uh so then <clears throat> if it's not the moon then where else could they be and you know uh i honestly think 
that they they basically they go where we are not okay and where we are not is in the deep ocean so if you're going to study uh, creatures that you are investigating uh you go up to the yukon and you say we're going to study these elk herds you don't just walk among the elk do you mm -mm. no you set up a blind right and you sit in the blinds and you observe undercover well elk don't recognize humans behind the blind so they can get we can get away with that okay but we're smart whether you like to admit it or not uh, we're pretty darn smart and you know an alien species knows that they know that as as stupid as we are we can certainly hurt them mm -hmm. and uh just like fire ants could ultimately kill you if you let them bite you enough mm -hmm. okay and fire ants certainly not as not as intelligent as we are right so clearly um alien creatures would have to feel the need to stay away from us or hide now advanced technologies means that they could <clears throat> Coming in and out of the water, it will. They could go wherever they want, <clears throat> transfer in and out. They could stay in the bulk, half in the bulk, half out of the bulk to sort of stay in that oscillation phase and travel underwater at high speed. So they'd kind of be there and kind of not be there, which is exactly what the trace was on the boat. It was kind of there and it kind of wasn't there, uh, you know, and moving several hundred knots. So uh, I think that that is sort of. Uh, evidence if you will about uh, the possibility that maybe they're using this technology now you know we've had plenty of opportunities to study unknown submerged objects that have occurred here a few cases have, have been reported right um but the fact is you know people think you know well you know i go on the google earth and you see we've mapped the whole ocean <laughs> no we haven't yeah. <laughs> no we haven't say this is the truth 16 percent of the oceans have been mapped 16 percent, not 60 not 35, 16% have been actually mapped. The rest that you see on there is interpolation based on very, very rough uh, right. soundings and bathymetry, it's called, that was taken. Uh, very rough. And it's not remotely accurate. Okay. The parts that are accurate on Google Earth, you can actually go and zoom in and see extreme amounts of detail for those tiny little pieces that were accurately uh, right. put down there. Okay, and they know that, you know, they would know that, and they would say, "Well, let's go where they're not." Torg, take us down to fifteen thousand feet. <laughs> okay, sure, why not? Uh, our ships can handle it because all we got to do is effectively change the sign on our pressure equation because we're really not there at all. Okay, we're half in, we're half out. You know, we can be there if we want to. We can stay down there forever because we have a fusion reactor creating all the particles we need. <laughs> you know. Just don't let that fusion reactor run out of fuel. <laughs> that would be think, the end. Sorry, I just uh, thinking here. Do you think when they transfer in and out of the bulk that they pull uh, matter from Earth into the bulk? And if so, do they also transfer matter that's in the bulk back in the, onto Earth? <clears throat> well, they generate matter that's that's that comes from the bulk with their fusion reactor. Right. They generate the KK gravitons, and that's actually there's a process that it could be understood. To, to see how they actually do that. Um, but let's suppose you build a ship here in the XYZ moving through time, our four dimensions, time is the fourth dimension, and you decided you were going to uh, yeah, go into the bulk with it. You would have to put a particle accelerator inside. You'd have to actually make sure you could sheet your ship with these KK gravitons and not just send them all out willy-nilly. They would have to actually be contained around your ship in some fashion. Uh, and once you did that, you would actually automatically find yourself slipping out of our XYZ movement through time and into that bulk. So the mass that you created here in, er in Earth space, okay, could technically transfer out, you know, so that would, that's the kind of matter you could transfer. Anything contained within those graviton sheath, that graviton sheath and micro black hole sheath, that would actually transfer out. Um, so I, what I was, what I was thinking like, you know, if they're underwater and they're, you know, going in and out of the, of the bulk, <clears throat> are they pulling micro amounts of our water right into the bulk and bringing it back and blowing it in and bringing it back? Well, 
keep in mind, perhaps, okay, perhaps, but keep in mind that the other thing that's happening is uh, what's actually pulling in anything are these micro black holes. Right. Okay. Now, the KK gravitons create the micro black holes. So the KK graviton and becomes the micro black hole, and the micro black hole pulls in a little bit of water, let's say, and then evaporates. Now, not evaporates like water, but, but black holes evaporate in general. And the bigger ones, like the one at the heart of Measure 87, the one that was imaged so brilliantly uh, several years ago, and like the one that's at the heart of our galaxy that was measured and, and imaged just uh, more recently, okay, those are the big boys. Those are galactic size black holes. Um, but over time, left to their own, if they had nothing else to enter them, they would evaporate. All right, and the smaller the black hole, the quicker it'll evaporate. Um, you know, those black holes in the galaxies, they could exist for probably tens and hundreds of billions of years. But the micro black holes are just a few nanoseconds. And in that time, maybe they did pull in some molecules of water or whatever. Uh, but once they do that, uh, they evaporate and that water is gone. And that leaves you to wonder, you say, well, wait, matter can't create, be created or destroyed. No, it's being converted to another form of energy. Right. Okay. So, but that's what's happening as well. And that is part and parcel to what takes it into the bulk. There's a lot of energy being generated that we're not even talking about, you know. Um, so in the bottom line, some elements of water and air are going to be absorbed by these micro black holes ever so small amounts and then those those black holes evaporate only to be replaced by yet another one and another one right. and another one uh to keep that process going you know everything you know everything in the universe vibrates so you know this oscillation would probably be a natural thing to do for a ship to travel in and out of the bulk um and but the point being let me give you another example here Let's suppose you're not underwater. Let's suppose you're in our atmosphere and you decide, I want to go to Alpha Centauri. Why? Because they make the greatest ham sandwich over on Proxima. This is true. Yes, right? You've been there. You've okay. been there. You know. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you decide you're going to go. So what you do is you take your ship into the bulk. <clears throat> See you in a little while. Okay. You take your ship into the bulk. And you, you punch out of our X, Y, and Z moving through time space and you punch into a new entry point that's over near Proxima Centauri. Okay. And that's depends on, on the ability to generate enough of these gra gravitons to bring you to the most, you know, uh, distorted and warped part of the bulk that allows you to make this jump in the shortest amount of time. You literally avoid everything including light speed. There's no more speed limits. You don't have a speed limit because you're punching out and punching in. Yeah. So in a sense, and I've said this, if you have an alien race that's using this technology, then they are the greatest, fundamentally the best cartographers, map makers mm -hmm. in the entire universe. And probably the greatest scientists of all of the, the, of the entire universe, because they would know every punch in punch out location. Right, and they would be able to manage the science of maintaining a ship that's constantly generating these KK particles and, and managing course, the oscillation. And of course, they don't have to be—they um, don't have to share that technology with anybody. They could be Greyhound bus drivers of the universe <laughs> and just drive people around from spot to spot. Right? Oh, what I wouldn't give to just be a dry up. What we'll wear that gray cap for a day? Yeah, <laughs> Where to? I'd like to go to NGC 7822. Oh, the Emission Nebula? Oh, great this time of year. We'll yeah. be there in about 12 minutes. Sit down, buckle up. Two, and off you go. That'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. I'm yep. sure getting your license for that is going to be a little tougher than your job. Yeah, no, it's like driver's test is murder, man. <laughs> yeah. you got to be able to parallel park between the moon and the earth, so... Especially when parallel park means parallel universe. Hey, you know? right, yeah. Ooh, you're in the wrong universe, son. Oh, right. no. Oh, I yeah. failed. Afraid so. Come back next millennium. Oh. 
This is going to be yeah. the next Star Tours. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, well, Mark, it looks like we're getting close to, to getting out of time here. So I wanted to make sure and uh, give you an opportunity to, uh, first of all, say thank you so much for all of that incredible yeah. information. I know we haven't even scratched the surface yet, um, but also share just you know what what you've got going on what what are some things that are going on that you'd like to share people and where they can find uh information uh on you and and the things you do sure um you know uh being a, a crazy astronomer like i am uh i do public outreach and so uh we did make this remote observatory out in the desert uh, in arizona and this remote desert uh observatory is open on clear nights uh not for people to visit directly <laughs> but for people to join us on YouTube. And so uh, we will, in fact, uh, do that fairly often um, on most clear nights, like I said. Uh, this is an example of the screen. Let me see if I can. Yeah, so this is an example of, of what people see. Okay, so this is our telescope in the building. This is my telescope control system. This is the Pleiades, uh, and we always label it. And this is the camera control system. And sometimes if it's really good, I'll expand it. This is all live too. This is, yeah. you know, we do this live and uh, we, we take pictures and we stack them together. So we take one picture and then take a second picture, align them and stack them together all the way up, make a sandwich of images to make the starlight and, and intricate details of a nebula pop and come out and the noise get lost. And that's just what happens. You know, so uh, that's uh, an example of what we do. Um, you know, we did uh, we did some amazing uh, did some amazing stuff. I I'll show you another one. This uh, so this one, all right, is really cool because what this is showing this right here. I don't know if you see that white dot down there. This yep. is a lunar eclipse on uh, January twentieth of two thousand nineteen, and we were streaming it live. Okay, we're using the Connecticut Observatory. This is the Connecticut building here. Uh, we've since gotten rid of the dome, and we got a new building going up. We've outgrown it, so we're adding more equipment, more stuff. Well, this is the moon, and this is the height of the lunar eclipse. It's blood red down here, and we and only five other groups on the planet caught this right here. Wow. This is a meteor striking the moon during the eclipse. Wow. And we caught it, you know. Now that's two hundred forty thousand miles away, <clears throat> and it made yeah it looks it doesn't it, but in fact it was all it was less than less than eighteen inches long at least less than eighteen wow. inches across, but that's how much energy is released with an impact, and um, all the energy of that motion that kinetic energy right of motion, got converted into heat, and it glowed white hot for a period of time ever so brief it was just a blink think it was gone. Several viewers caught it, and I missed it during the initial run. And then when I went back, I saw it, and I looked it up, and sure enough, it was a meteor. And they went back later with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, did a pass, and guess what? They found a new crater on the moon right that's there. so cool. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so we're one of five groups to catch it. And it's all from Sky Tour live stream right here. You know, and, um, you know, our desert observatory is a really cool observatory. It's, it's really neat. We do... Uh, awesome things out there, and I would just hope that people would join us on YouTube and check us out. We have prints that we sell. We also have uh, free. We have a free database where people can go up and see all of our data uh, each night. In fact, we take pictures, and within seconds, they go all the way up out to the cloud, and uh, they're available for people to download all over the world within seconds. And uh, they're beautiful, very, very beautiful high-res images. Okay. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we do, and I'm telling you, uh, people just absolutely love it. Okay, um, give you an, one last example, and then obviously I know you guys want to move along. But well, just, just while you're looking at, it, we're two people who absolutely love it. So okay, yeah. well, cool. <laughs> yeah, and this is uh, this one. I literally shot this two days ago. Oh my god. Wow. This is called the Heart Nebula. And you see all these uh, dark, sorry, you see all these dark areas in here. Okay. This is dark dust. All right. And it's this is that hot button I was telling you about for me, because this is where stars are formed inside this dust. 
Okay, and it's in this area, in these areas, where new stars will be formed and new planets will be uh, um, soon to arrive. These these little guys right here, these are called elephant's trunks. Um, there are areas where there's this dust is dense enough, so they resist being uh, uh, eroded away by the hot starlight from this new cluster over here. And that uh, means that in there, somewhere right in there, it's probably going to be a new star sometime soon you know so we look at those things all the time this actually was the image almost exactly like this is what people saw when we shot this that night that was just two nights ago that's fantastic it also looks kind of like a crab coming at you boom it does doesn't it it's like <laughs> it's like opening everything is about to you know eat you and yeah and, uh, yeah oh, thanks for that and i'll never unsee that yeah, I, I don't know. I see a dog, so I don't know. You know, I don't oh, see a wow, dog. Is that, I guess, yeah, right? No. <laughs> That's like the legs coming. He's like a two dimensional dog. Got the yeah, yeah, true. Hair, tail, legs coming in. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I'm so glad to have had you back again, and you are always welcome on the show. Uh, Thanks, man. It was anything. great being there because you guys are a lot of fun. You know that, right? <laughs> we do. <laughs> really I feel there, like we're in the Brady Bunch that. now. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can get a couple more people in here. Yeah, uh, right. But yeah. There we go. Thank you so much, Mark. You guys check out uh, all Mark stuff. Check out that YouTube page because it is, and we'll have it on the uh, description here. So make sure to check okay, that yeah. out. Um, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. Just a reminder if you're listening on the podcast, you want to see what we share to go to youtube.com slash fearscape media and check out this episode so you can see all the stuff that everyone that watched on YouTube saw. Uh, <laughs> and if you guys just want to listen while you're in the car, listen to it on spotify and apple Podcasts and all that jazz <laughs> do all the good stuff or the onyx network we're also on the onyx network that's what we do um, but other than that thank you guys so much for tuning in this has been stefan just a reminder keep your eyes on the skies this has been josh the truth is now and remember folks keep questioning keep searching good night everybody good night see you later